Good evening, everyone. I'm making this video to fulfill the requirements for the post for last week. Um, I thought this was uh, the last couple of weeks. We've had some incredible readings, um, and I thought I would just take a moment to talk about the questions that we were asked to consider for posting this week. Um, the first question was, how do the authors investigate power as it relates to institutionalized oppression? I found... Um, uh, a few quotes that really struck me. Uh, the first was uh, from Ladson and Billings and Tate. Uh, they said that to mount viable challenge to the dominant paradigm of ethnicity, i.e. we are all ethnic and consequently must assimilate and rise socially the same way European Americans have. Um, that really resonated with me with all of the other readings that we have done uh, for the last few weeks um, or throughout this course. I really, the, the, the general part that's resonated with me the most as a professional is the idea that um, everyone else should be like European Americans. And I do not believe that, but the work in the reading has cemented that for me in a way that I could not have um, articulated it prior to the course. Uh, Delpit went on to say that that uh, to provide schooling for everyone's children, children that reflects liberal middle-class values and aspirations is to ensure the maintenance of the status quo, to ensure that power, the culture of power, remains in the hands of those who already have it. And to me, that really connects right back to what Ladson, Billings, and Tate said, that um, you basically have to become like a European-American to gain power in in uh, in our country, uh, and that certainly would lend itself to institutionalized oppression on a very high level. Um, the next question that uh, we were asked to consider is, um, uh, where is power explicitly named? I, I found it to be named throughout um, the articles, but one 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 really great. Uh, quote really struck me, which was Glaze, Mattingly, and Levin when they quoted Michael Fullan as stating that um, uh, the role of the principal, and he talks about how um, the principal must recognize the, the need for change in the school uh, by starting with themselves. I thought that was really, really great. And then Glaze, Mattingly, and Levin also said that principals are not the, uh, the exact quote is, principals are by no means the only advocates in the education system. Teachers in general, and teachers unions in particular, have always provided strong advocacy uh, for issues pertaining to children and youth. And I, I think I've found that to be very true, and and my wife and I, as lifelong educators, have always felt that um, advocating for children is one of the most important things that we do. Um, uh, in terms of explicitly naming power, Delpit, talked about um, the issues of power being enacted in classrooms, and I found it to be very powerful. Um, this, this, uh, this quote said uh, that the power of the teacher over the students, the power of the publishers of textbooks, and of the developers of the curriculum to determine the view of the world presented, the power of the state in enforcing compulsory ed school schooling, and the power of an individual or group to determine another's intelligence or normalcy. Uh, those are really important things because we often talk about the power of the teacher or the power of parents or lack of power of parents um, and sometimes the power that students have over one another. Um, I really found the, the, uh, um, that quote talking about the curriculum and the power of the curriculum and the way the curriculum is taught is, is really at the heart of the work that I'm doing uh, on improving student reading at the high school level in a, in a suburban school. Uh, district or a rural school district. Um, I also thought it was really interesting that Bloom talked about community-based organizations and the ways, uh, the exact quote was that they alone cannot make up for the policies that make getting an education so difficult for lone mothers in poverty. Um, it, I, Bloom also went on to say that it is imperative that the university educators take a stand and make common cause with their progressive local CBOs, community-based organizations, by both advocating against damaging policies and contributing their expertise to the community-based organizations. I, I came from a, a, a very poor 
family and a single mom, and I know how hard it was for me to get an education. And I think that uh, Bloom wrote about some really important things about the struggles that uh, particularly single mothers in poverty face and the, the, the role that the higher education uh, community can take in rectifying that. And I, I hadn't thought of that, so I thought it was a really important point to consider. Um, another question we were asked to consider is, where is in power implicit or hidden? And Delpit, I thought, said it perfectly. Those with power are least frequently aware of or at least willing to acknowledge its existence. And those with less powers are often most aware of its existence. I think that pretty much summed that question up. He also said um, the critical race theory centers the research, pedagogy, and policy lens on communities of color and calls into question white middle-class communities as the standard by which all others are judged. So I really appreciated that Yasso was saying that um, there, uh, the problem isn't that there are white middle-class communities. The problem is that they are being used as a standard to judge all other communities. And, and, and I do agree personally on a very deep level that that is not fair or appropriate. Um, the last question that we were asked to consider is how is difference acknowledged, promoted, and, and or normalized? And I've been reflecting on that a lot this semester, and I really felt that um, Yasso did a great job of uh, um, articulating that by saying that deficit thinking takes the position that minority students and families are at fault for poor academic performance because A, the students enter school without the normative cultural knowledge and skills, and B, parents neither value nor support their children's education. And then uh, you also went on to say, as a result, the schooling efforts usually aim at filling up supposedly passive students with forms of cultural knowledge deemed valuable by the dominant society, which I think ties right into the previous quote by, um, by uh, uh, Delpit about the power structure of those who have the power not being willing to acknowledge um, its existence because as we learned earlier in the course by acknowledging the existence those in power may have to give some up to share more equally with others uh, again in summary i thought the readings this last couple of weeks were fantastic it's very difficult to summarize this in five to seven minutes but i tried my best and i hope you're all having a great week